the big question is, what is the phenomenology of human consciousness? When it comes to the scientific explanation for what consciousness is, science is only beginning to work towards that goal. At least now we can finally say there is something worthy of inquiry. This is where philosophy needs to take part in the process, maintaining its traditional relationship with science. Philosophy's task is to attempt, among other things, to understand why consciousness behaves as it does, transcending from this reality to another, and perhaps even returning. A phenomenon coincidentally described by the phrase often used in quantum mechanics. Considering the substantial amount of corroborated information from near-death experiences, one could speculate that medical science, through these reports, represents a new source of wisdom previously provided by ancient scripture. This, by the way, is a prime example of sublation, which involves both letting go and preserving something at the same time. It's the process where the old aspect of a concept is included in the new, improved version of the concept. In ancient times, we had sages, prophets and others who provided wisdom, often sacrificing their lives in doing so, and their ability to capture spiritual insights was exceptional and abundant. Interestingly, there is an explanation for why there are so many spiritual writings from ancient times, whereas we, on the other hand, now have developed medical science to gain similar wisdom. As we have learned from Ian McGilchrist, instead of enhancing the connection between the hemispheres, evolution seems to move in the opposite direction. And in the case of the modern human brain, its twin hemispheres are often described as two autonomous systems. Moreover, Ian McGilchrist quotes Julian Jaynes, who was a psychologist at Princeton with an interest in the ancient world, who put forward a thesis that consciousness, in the sense of introspective self-awareness, first arose in Homeric Greece. He posits that when the heroes of the Iliad and the Old Testament are reported as having heard the voices of the gods or God, giving them commands or advice, this is not a figurative expression. They literally heard voices. The voices were speaking their own intuitive thoughts and arose from their own minds, but were perceived as external because, at this time, man was becoming newly aware of his own unconscious intuitive thought processes. Jaynes identifies these intuitive thought processes with the workings of the right hemisphere. However, as McGilchrist continues, putting it at its simplest, where Jaynes interprets the voices of the gods as being due to the disconcerting effects of the opening of a door between the hemispheres, so that the voices could for the first time be heard, I see them as being due to the closing of the door, so that the voices of intuition now appear distant, familiar but alien, wise but uncanny, in a word, divine. Here we see why there were plentiful insights in ancient times. It was due to the evolution of the hemispheres, where they were just beginning to become autonomous, destined to become better in and of themselves. Today, the left hemisphere has excelled in its role, particularly in advancing medical science. This progress has enabled doctors to resuscitate individuals who have been clinically dead for hours, providing a glimpse into the afterlife. This is a good example of what Ian McGilchrist talked about when elaborating on the hierarchy of attention, which, for a number of reasons, implies a grounding role and an ultimately integrating role for the right hemisphere, with whatever the left hemisphere does at the detailed level needing to be founded on and then return to the picture generated by the right. This is an instance of the right-left-right -right progression that lies at the very foundation of experience, where the world actually comes into being. Even though we have credible sources reporting that consciousness persists after the death of the brain, some people may still refuse to accept these findings, which is an unscientific stance. So let's look at this from another perspective. These reports offer multiple benefits to individuals, whether you believe that consciousness persists after the death of the brain or not. For example, all religions share a common goal, which is to teach us to stop arguing over which religion is the true and only one. Secularists might not be concerned with this, 
but if this knowledge were embraced, it could resolve many serious problems stemming from religious divisions that have plagued humanity, even affecting atheists. Another benefit from glimpses into this realm beyond is the opportunity to self-reflect, something not often practiced in this world. This reminds us of the importance of self-reflection, taking time to meditate on, evaluate, and give serious thought to our behaviors, thoughts, attitudes, motivations, and desires. A third benefit from near-death experience reports is the development of empathy, a sign of emotional maturity. Many NDE reports describe how when consciousness is free from the brain's inhibitions, individuals can recall everything they have said, done, or intended, and understand how they made others feel. This, too, is beneficial to consider when reflecting on your desires, intentions, and actions toward others. All this valuable knowledge, which I believe it is, due to its clear sense of rationality, might offend many people. First, religious individuals who have been culturally raised to be loyal to their particular faith may find this knowledge unacceptable. Many major religions have historically, or still believe, their religion reflects the only true God and that everyone else must convert to their faith. Other religions may claim they're the only chosen faith, dismissing others entirely. Secondly, pacifists may reject this knowledge outright upon hearing the word God and therefore ignore the psychological benefits it offers, resulting in a form of nihilism. In extreme cases, some people adhere to a Darwinist view of the survival of the fittest and believe in moral relativism, the idea that there is no universal or absolute set of moral principles. This perspective is based on a distorted idea of rationality called instrumental rationality, which means doing whatever it takes to achieve a goal as long as it aligns with your ultimate objective. The end justifies the means. Thirdly, we have the active deniers who hold the belief that humans are intrinsically useless and advocate for transhumanism or posthumanism. They have given up on the individual and believe that artificial intelligence is the only solution. The strange thing about this third perspective is that it seems nonsensical to say the least. If one stops to think about this for just a moment, it becomes apparent that concluding humans are useless and insignificant is misguided. Considering how rare life is in the known universe, one must arrive at the opposite conclusion. Life, and we as evolved human beings, have survived untold hardships and are still here. This indicates that we are not useless, but rather exceptional. The idea behind discussing insights we can gain from NDEs and implementing or at least being aware of such sensibilities here and now, is not a new concept. In the well-known painting by Raphael, The School of Athens, we see that Plato points to the sky because his philosophy is centered around an eternal and ideal reality of forms, while Aristotle gestures out at the world in front of him, indicating his interest in studying the changing reality around him. These two philosophers have been important to Western thinking generally and in different ways and their different philosophies were incorporated into Christianity. Plato's forms, like redness, roundness, beauty, justice or goodness, are eternal and ideal realities. However, individual objects like a red car, a round ball, a beautiful person, or a just action reside in the physical realm and are examples of the forms taking shape here on Earth. So, in addition to contemplating Plato's eternal forms, we can add what we learn from NDEs, such as insights about religion requiring unification at a certain level, and the importance of self-reflection that is beneficial to consider when reflecting on your desires, intentions and actions toward others. I chose the phrase bridging paradigms to convey a shift from our current paradigm to a new one. Initially, I thought the phrase was a bit vague but as I progressed with my goal, I began to see its relevance in different ways. We have discussed the two hemispheres of the brain and their different modes of operation, 
which can be seen as distinct paradigms or worlds. Now, with the idea of bridging the worlds of Plato and Aristotle with the knowledge we have gained from NDEs, which offers more insights from the eternal realm, we can, in a sense, begin to envision a new paradigm. That is akin to bringing heaven to earth. There is one drawback to using the word bridge for a project. In modern culture, the phrase, and if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you, has been used to imply gullibility. This phrase became popular due to the exploits of George C. Parker, a notorious American con man in the early 20th century. Parker is best known for repeatedly selling the Brooklyn Bridge. He made a living by conducting fraudulent sales of properties he did not own, often targeting New York's public landmarks and unwary immigrants. The Brooklyn Bridge was a frequent subject of his scams, where he convinced buyers they could control access and charge tolls. Police often had to remove his victims as they attempted to set up toll booths on the bridge. Parker is remembered as one of the most successful con men in U.S. history and one of the most talented hoaxers. So I'd like to address this potential bias regarding an afterlife, which may seem far-fetched and only for the gullible. I want to clarify that everything I have discussed is based on verifiable facts from credible sources, such as Dr. Sam Parnia and Dr. Jeffrey Long, both of whom can be easily researched. And the information on hemisphere function comes from Ian McGilchrist, a British psychiatrist, literary scholar, philosopher, and neuroscientist known for his 2009 book, The Master and His Emissary, the divided brain, and the making of the Western world. Everything else I discuss stems from my own honest, pragmatic speculation.